end of the last tape, we were just going to start on the All-American Canal lining, which this year is becoming quite prominent. Yes, it's uh, continuing to be a big issue. But uh, in the early 80s, uh, we started to do some negotiations on with the Imperial Irrigation District where uh, MWD would do uh, pay for the canal lining and get the conserved water, which was just under 100,000 acre feet of water at that time. Uh, <clears throat> we dealt with Mel Levine, who was a congressman from West Los Angeles, and Alan Cranston, who was our senator, and got them to introduce bills which would authorize us to do the canal lining. <clears throat> and uh, Mel Levine, <clears throat> who was my principal author, uh, was very uh, concerned that MWD was bullying Imperial Irrigation District in this legislation. And he, number one, he wanted complete assurance that this was something that IID would agree to. Secondly, he wanted to make sure that it was a program that was strongly supported within urban Southern California, within MWD's boundaries. Excuse me. So there were <clears throat> long negotiations with Imperial on how to put this project together. And in the meantime, uh, I got our local government affairs unit at MWD to get statements of support from all kinds of people. Uh, chambers of Commerce, Boards of Supervisors, City Councils, member agencies, and uh, probably the most prolific in that was Brad Hilcher, who was working in the local government affairs unit at the time and handling San Diego and Orange County. And we finally got so many resolutions of support that the staffer I was working with in Levine's office finally said, no more. I got all I need. Don't send me one more. And then she handed me all of them and said, they're yours. Now I know who they're from. I don't want them in my office. And we had a stack about two inches thick. I'm Brad and others had really done their homework. Concurrently with that, uh, the uh, Vista irrigation district and the city of Escondido were in a fight with the five local Indian tribes in this area uh, over water rights on the San Luis Rey River. And so as a part of the whole canal lining process uh, at MWD they negotiated a deal on behalf of Vista and Escondido where a portion of the water for the All-American Canal lining uh, would go to make up the water that the Indians felt that they had lost to Escondido and Vista uh, from their very early development of, of uh, the San Luis Rey River. It got to be a fairly complex issue after a while because Coachella Valley Water District, whenever they saw a drop of water that IID wasn't going to use, would come in and say, well, we get a piece of that because we're ahead of MWD in the priority scheme in California for uh, use of Colorado River water. That's a component of the seven-party agreement? Yes. <clears throat> and they are considered a part of the agricultural allocation of 3.85 million acre feet, which has priority over any MWD water in the uh, Colorado River. 
Um, the, uh, the negotiations got fairly complex. And at that time, George Miller of Martinez, California, was chairman of the House Interior and Insular Affairs Committee. And his staff director was Dan Beard, who later became Commissioner of Reclamation. Uh, but uh, I kept talking to him. He had no sympathy for IID. Dan never particularly cared for irrigation districts. But he said, we've got to solve this, otherwise we're not going to get, to get this bill passed. <coughs> so uh, he said, let's get a meeting of the players. And so we got IID and uh, Coachella, uh, somebody representing the Indians, and there were odds and ends of other people around congressional staff of, from different offices. And we sat down and my office in downtown Washington, D.C., and spent a day arguing out and compromising the bill, and finally came up with a workable version, and that's the bill that passed Congress. Uh, it was uh, a, a good negotiation, and I appreciated Beard doing it, and. Uh, so we finally resolved that problem. When it passed Congress, it had the Indian settlement in it uh, and the All-American Canal Lining project authorized. Uh, it still has not been lined. <laughs> uh, the uh, farmers in the Mexicali Valley uh, pump from seepage from the All-American Canal at the present time in a fairly significant amount, apparently, and they are still protesting the lining of the canal. Uh, and the uh, Mexicali Valley is in Mexico, it's south of the border. Right, yes. <clears throat> and uh, it's a fairly large irrigation area, as I recall, it's 400 to 500,000 acres of, <coughs> of irrigated land. And, uh, and as I recall, Bob, one of the issues is that the water that is pumped by the farmers in Mexicali Valley that seeps from the All-American Canal is not counted as part of the 1944 treaty work. Correct, yes. And when we initially started discussing this and uh, we met with the uh, International Boundary and Water Commission people and their lawyers looked at the issue and said, the Mexicans have no entitlement to this water. We are entitled to conserve waters in our projects. <coughs> and. Uh, but uh, and we took that position during uh, the debate on this legislation. But as you well know, that issue is still kind of a burning issue as a part of this whole settlement effort that we're undertaking today on the quantification settlement agreement for the <coughs> San Diego Imperial Irrigation District water transfer going on as we speak. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, or, not. <laughs> or, not, or not. Yes. <laughs> so those are kind of the, the most significant issues I think I worked on with respect to the Colorado River. Uh, you know, obviously I had lots of other issues going on that had to do with the California State Water Project and <clears throat> we're not related to the Colorado River, so. Okay. In your note to me before we set this appointment up, uh, you also uh, indicated uh, water for desert power plants. What, uh, what was the issue oh, there? Oh, yes. 
Um, in the 70s, uh, the Primarily, the San Diego Gas and Electric Company wanted to build a nuclear power plant called Sun Desert out in near Palo Verde, California. Uh, <clears throat> they had no particular water supply. They wanted to develop water for the power plant cooling, of course, which is necessary. And their argument to Metropolitan Water District was, we need this Colorado River water. The power will be sold within the boundaries of the Metropolitan Water District, because they've got all of the urban area in San Diego County. So it seems legitimate that MWD should supply the water for this power plant. Well, when those <clears throat> discussions first began, and San Diego Gas and Electric was still in the very early planning stages of the Sun Desert plant, Edison and Los Angeles Department of Water and Power came in and said, well, why not us, too? We may want to build some power plants out in the desert, uh, some location, nothing identified particularly. Uh, so the MWD board agreed to set aside 100,000 acre feet of water for the three projects. And I did this by board resolution or something like that. I forget exactly the, the form that it took. Uh, that happened during my watch as general counsel at MWD and, and also as assistant. Uh, as San Diego Gas and Electric moved forward with its planning, then they wanted to, you know, start to put this into a, a form that would give them some assurance that the water would be there. So there were contract negotiations. I think we allocated 30,000 acre feet of water to San Diego Gas and Electric, which would probably have been developed through some kind of a water exchange with the Palo Verde Irrigation District. Uh, Edison and LA Water and Power's proposals for desert power plants did not mature. Uh, they didn't move forward on that, uh, on their plans. <clears throat> but the San Diego Gas and Electric one uh, did mature. They also worked out an arrangement with Palo Verde Irrigation District itself uh, to buy some water from them because I think that they needed about 50,000 acre feet of water. Uh, as you know, of course, the the uh, the Sun Desert nuclear power plant was never built. Uh, in fact, I think uh, Metropolitan Water District uh, not only acquired the property that they had for the plant site, uh, but also acquired the the water right that they had developed with Palo Verde Irrigation District. The land for the desert uh, power plant uh, <clears throat> was acquired by MWD as mitigation lands for other projects. And that just happened recently. And that just happened recently. Uh, so that was kind of the end of the, the desert power plant uh, program, but uh, it, was, uh, it was a fairly vigorous uh, proposal. We had, there was a, the, the head of the lands division for San Diego Gas and Electric, uh, Frank DeVore, 
and uh, Bob McGinnis, who was their lawyer at Loose Forward here in San Diego, uh, practically lived at MWD for a while working on those uh, water contracts. And uh, so uh, it, it was a fairly vigorous uh, program. So, um, if you have any questions or anything. Uh, um, I would ask you to, uh, you've mentioned a number of people that you have run across and worked with over time. Um, are there any others, w without regard to specific projects like CAP and Colorado River Salinity and whatnot, are there other people that you have run across, uh, elected officials or otherwise, uh, that uh, leap to your mind as being influential on the development of Colorado River policy and practices over time? Well, I didn't really talk much about Myron Holbert. I think I referred to him just in connection with the salinity control program. But Myron was the director or whatever he was of the Colorado River Board for a number of years before he went over to Metropolitan in the early 80s. And, and Myron, uh, I think had a very substantial reputation. Myron's honesty was beyond reproach. And while nobody in the other states in the Colorado River Basin liked California, uh, in some cases it was even worse than not just not liking us, but they trusted Myron. And he could deal with them. And he did. And he was very important in the latter days of the Central Arizona Project issues. And of course, during the Salinity Control Program, uh, he was influential on resolving this uh, uh, Indian water rights issue from, with Escondido and uh, Vista. His, his name really stands out to me. Uh, I suppose I could name a number. Uh, trying to think in Washington itself. Uh, uh, Bruce Babbitt was a very active Secretary of Interior. Uh, and tried to resolve a number of issues that California had. Uh, I think he was quite effective. He started off on the wrong foot with Congress trying to do some things which it didn't take Congress long to kill him. But uh, later on when he got involved in the Colorado River issues and got involved in uh, the Cal-Fed issues in California, uh, he, he did a pretty good job, I think. There were some concerned when Babbitt was named Secretary of Interior that uh, he might owe too great an allegiance to the state of Arizona, uh, where he was governor and uh, long family history. Oh, yes. Uh, did he overcome that? I think he did pretty well. I think the Californians came to trust him. I think that uh, a lot of the Arizonans never really liked Babbitt. He was governor for a long time, but uh, the water guys in Arizona didn't like him. Um, as a part of the authorization of the Central Arizona Project, or not as a part of well, I guess it was a part of the authorization. Uh, afterwards, the Arizonans were required to implement a groundwater law in the state of Arizona, something which California has never done. And 
the water guys hated him for it. It was a communist plot. It was a deprival of basic American rights. But he ran it through, and I think uh, you know, uh, there's still some anger over it, but they do have now a, uh, a groundwater law which uh, they've implemented to try and protect overdrawn groundwater basins. Uh, I think he was probably a pretty good secretary. Uh, when President Reagan was governor of California, was water on his radar screen or was it uh, a non-issue for him? Yeah, it was on his radar screen because the peripheral canal was a major issue. Bill Ginelli was his director of water resources, a California engineer from Stockton, California. And Bill told me that uh, in his dealings with the governor, were, here is my home number. You call me whenever you need me. You know, don't just call up and have a conversation, but uh, I am available to help you at any time. And he was. I think pretty well aware of, of that. And uh, <clears throat> so I, you know, I think there was, there was some effort. When uh, he was governor, <clears throat> the California governor's office in Washington, D.C. was a one-man operation. And we had about two or three during that period of time, but I know that when I would go over there and ask for some help on an issue, uh, the, the individual, uh, first was a guy by the name of Ed Gillen Waters from San Diego, he used to work for Bob Wilson, who was a congressman, I think, and it was Jim Jenkins. Uh, they'd say, look, you go ahead and do whatever you need. He says, we'll back you up. You know, just kind of keep me posted. But he said, you know, I got a one-man operation. <laughs> I'm trying to do the lobbying for the entire state of government. And, uh, you know, as far as we're concerned, uh, water is in good hands. Not necessarily mine, but, you know, the water community. So, uh, I... I think he would have been helpful if he'd have been asked, but fortunately we never got to the point where we had to ask him for help. Uh, I mean, it, the, uh, you know, the governors have generally been okay. Uh, Jerry Brown was interesting. He actually permitted his Department of Water Resources to put together a peripheral canal project which, of course, died, but uh, and they've generally been supportive. And Jerry Brown is the, the first governor that developed a larger staff in the Washington, D.C. office so that we had somebody that we could bring along to meetings and, you know, wave the California bear flag and help us out. How about governors from other states? Any of them? come to mind as being particularly active on Colorado River issues? Yeah, during the final days of the, uh, of the Central Arizona Project stuff, uh, they had a one-eyed governor by the name of Jack Williams. He lost an eye somewhere down the line. They Arizona? The Arizonans, yes. And uh, he was very good very active in promotion of the Central Arizona Project. Uh, in fact, uh, it was Morris Udall, who was probably one of the finest people I ever met in my life, was a congressman from Arizona. Uh, also had one eye and he made his, he had a tremendous sense of humor. 
he made some crack to the Californians about, well, between the governor and me, we've only got two eyes, but they're both pointed at you in California. <laughs> and he was, he was very clever. Um, uh, he, he was excellent. Even at our worst fighting times during the Central Arizona Project, um, John Rhodes, who uh, was the, uh, the, the senior man on House Appropriations from the Republican Party, and Mo Udall were always accessible to me. Um, Paul Fannin, who was the governor at that time, later became the U.S. Senator, was the same way, uh, was very helpful. Uh, we had an interesting little period right at the end of 1964 when Claire Engel died uh, in the early summer, I guess, our, one, our senator. Pat Brown appointed Pierre Salinger, who had been one of the great John F. Kennedy supporters and spokespeople. Um, he made life pretty exciting for a while, but didn't really accomplish much uh, because George Murphy whipped him uh, in the November elections of that year. So he was only senator for six months at the most. Uh, we've had a, an interesting bunch of senators from California. <laughs> you indicated earlier that, and I'm just curiosity, I, I may just edit this out, but uh, you said Paul Laxalt was close to Nixon, right? No. Didn't Reagan. I say Reagan? Well, maybe you said Reagan. Huh? Yes. Okay, yeah. he was close to Reagan. Wasn't he also close to Joe Kennedy? Now that's going that on. I just don't know. I'm going back a long time. Yeah, here, I just don't know. I, I he could have been. I somehow got the impression that Kennedy was, in some some way, partially responsible for Laxalt, who is a, a Basque farming family guy, uh, ultimately running for public office in Nevada. I just honestly don't know. Yeah, okay. I I'm I think. It would have had to have been a long time ago because Joe Kennedy died. You're talking about Joe Kennedy, yeah. Daddy. Yeah. 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 It was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm trying That's to all remember. Been a young man. He was. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. Uh, there's a, a fairly new book out called uh, Las, "The Story of Las Vegas: The Money and the Power." Yeah, the money and the power. The story of Las Vegas, and Laxalt is uh, is prominent. I won't go into it here, but you got it. Yeah, I'll pick it up. Yeah, it's, it's fun. It's, yeah. it's really a fun book. And we got a good library here in town. They probably have it. Uh, so. Yeah, I'm sure they do. Yeah, uh, it's so. three months old. Uh, okay, anything else come to mind? Colorado River stuff? No, uh, not right offhand. You'd mentioned something about um, what uh, was the view of the Colorado River Compact during our days in fighting over the Colorado River, yeah, and um, it was always an issue. First of all, it was the Bible for the guys from the Upper Basin. Now, the compact was signed in... Uh, 1922. 22. Yes. And Arizona was the only state that did not sign the compact. It did not even agree to the compact until the 40s sometime. Uh, which leads me on another little digression for a minute. There was, uh, there was a guy in Arizona, and of course I've just read this, back in the 20s by the name of Coulter, who promoted the idea that the Colorado River and the Lower Basin belonged to Arizona. It flowed through Arizona uh, until it gets down to where it meets California. <laughs> And he said, it's all ours. And we should put together a program to fully develop it for the state of Arizona. Well, he managed to gain so much ascendancy in Arizona, apparently, that it's the reason that they did not sign the compact. 
these people were not willing to agree that there was anybody else in the lower basin under the compact. It was Arizona. <laughs> um, but of course, the, the compact was finally uh, implemented and the upper basin stuck by it. But during a lot of the, of the Central Arizona project fight, the upper basin guys took the position that the Mexican Water Treaty is a lower basin burden and not the upper basin. And that our requirement under the compact to deliver 75 million acre feet of water every 10 years uh, includes Mexico's entitlement of a million and a half acre feet a year, or whatever that turns out to be in 10 years. <clears throat> um, we never agreed with that, obviously. It's a burden to be shared by the entire Colorado River Basin. And I think the Upper Basin people have pretty well <clears throat> kind of ignored that old position that they had. But it was an issue that kept floating in and out during the compact days. But uh, the, the upper basin people wore that compact like a shield and uh, still do. Still do, <coughs> yes, yes. And that's the extent of their obligation. <laughs> so. But other, I mean, other than that, there wasn't a lot on the compact. We did in the in the final stages of negotiation on the Central Arizona project and trying to put it together. Uh, there's quite a bit of language in there about uh, <clears throat> the upper basin and the lower basin uh, balancing their reservoirs, basically Glen against uh, Lake Mead, and. Uh, so as to protect the upper basin's rights uh, to uh, its full allocation of Colorado River water. So it, um, the, the upper basin, lower basin fights haven't completely gone away. Had you ever gotten involved uh, directly or peripherally with respect to the, the total uh, Mexican U.S. water issue, which really incorporates the Rio Grande in Texas and the Little Colorado and a number of other issues. Uh, I, I'm wondering if, if the Colorado River that we're talking about here, the, the, ma the major Colorado River, uh, was ever offered up as a pawn in those uh, negotiations or discussions or, or whatnot. As you know, Mexico gets water out of other U.S based rivers as well. And as a, in this year, there's a, a major concern over Mexico repaying uh, some water that they had borrowed uh, over many years. And uh, President Fox, I think, has indicated that he, he's committed to paying back a, a fraction of that. And uh, so the United States isn't happy because he's only paying back a fraction, and the Mexican farmers aren't happy because he's sending water to the North. Uh, but I, I guess my, my question is, uh, does, at the federal level, does our Colorado River, I use R just to distinguish it from others, does our Colorado River get balled up in those discussions, or are they really separate? Well, the State Department wants to keep them separate. Uh, we have tried to ball them up together because we currently have uh, an argument initiated by environmental groups both in Mexico and in uh, the Seven Basin States over uh, additional flows into the Colorado River Delta uh, in Mexico to preserve environmental uh, uses, uh, fishery, uh, birds, uh, and <clears throat> the environmental groups have come up with a number of ploys to try
try and force uh, the seven basin states to give up some additional water to Mexico so it will flush out uh, the delta and rebuild some of the environmental needs down there. Uh, of course, we've taken a fairly adamant view that the treaty uh, is on quantity and it does say how much we have to release to Mexico and if the Mexicans need more water in their delta down there then they take it out of their 1.5. <coughs> but um, we've actually talked with uh, some of the, the uh, Texas border congressmen like uh, Hinojosa, Bonilla, Ortiz uh, to try and deal with them on you know understand their issues and what they're going through and they've actually reached the crisis stage now apparently they're at a point where uh, a lot of their farmers are just going to uh, we think because these are a part of the Mexican water treaties the Rio Grande just the Colorado, that we should look at this as a total package. And as long as uh, Mexico is violating the treaty on the Rio Grande, there is no way we can come to an accommodation with them on supplying additional water uh, on the Colorado. Uh, this hasn't really escalated very far. Uh, the whole issue on uh, the Colorado River Delta, of course, is now in court and we're kind of waiting to see what the results there are going to be. Uh, but uh, we've, uh, we've taken the view, because we're always scared to death of State Department. They're big border issues or immigration and drugs.
Central Arizona project. And in the event that was our program up in Arizona and California have an entitlement uh, to separate if the Bureau could not for those three states California would get it is 4.4 million while in This is simplification, but only to the extent that uh, within Arizona of, on diversions for the Central Arizona project. Uh, the other Arizona projects uh, could not be affected. Uh, they've been pretty well uh, approved in the, in the litigation. Okay, that's, that's an important point. Yeah. This went on for a couple of years, uh, starting in 64 and 65, uh, when we went through extensive negotiations. The <clears throat> chairman of the House Interior Committee, it's what it was called in those days, it's now called House Resources Committee, was Wayne Aspinall from the state of Colorado. And he was a domineering figure. That was in the days when the committee chairman ran the committee lock, stock, and barrel, hired all the employees, set the agenda not only of the full committee but every subcommittee, and nobody did anything without asking his permission. None of the subcommittees had separate staff in those days. That was born when the, the uh, Watergate babies came along in 73 and 74 uh, when the revolution started. But uh, before that time, committee chairmen were gods. And uh, we had a lot of struggles with Aspinall. Aspinall was basically sympathetic to Arizona, but he also wanted some additional protections and uh, uh, small projects up in the state of Colorado for his people. He wanted to get something out of it also. Uh, but to give you an idea of some of the members of our delegation, uh, Chet Hollifield and Craig Osmer worked this constantly. Uh, Craig was a Republican and was a fairly senior member of the House Interior Committee. Chet Hollifield was an even more senior Democrat, having come to the House, I believe, before World War II, and uh, was chairman of the Government Affairs Committee, and he and Craig were also uh, the chairman and the ranking members of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, which was a joint committee of both House and Senate. So they had quite a bit of seniority and a lot of punch and uh, were able to help us a great deal. To go back to Ely a little bit, Ely continued to take an extremely hard line on into 65 and 66 on a number of issues. At that time, we had the proposals to build two dams uh, straddling the Grand Canyon, Marble Canyon Dam and Bridge Canyon Dams. And there was a congressman from Pennsylvania, 
by the name of John Saylor, who was the ranking member of the Interior Committee as a Republican uh, in those days. The, the Democrats had such an overwhelming majority in the House that Republicans weren't paid too much attention, but uh, Saylor was a, a dominating guy and was taking the position of the environmental groups, uh, although he was a reasonably conservative Republican. And there is a story that he made an offer to Mike Ely of a very small Bridge Canyon Day.